Okay, so we're going to have a couch conversation. Where is the fabulous Tom Butcher? Where are you? Where are you? Are you down the back? So we're going to have... There he is. He snuck up around the side. Yeah. Hello. Hardly fabulous, ha but did you, you I think... Oh, you are so fabulous. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Come sit down. Okay, so we're going to have our... Uh, top, this would be our second last coach conversation of the day. Is, it, is this our last conversation? It's, it's the last one I'm doing. This is our People last are free, couch conversation. Then. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Tom who's convened all of these couch conversations bar one. After our couch conversation, you're going into parallel, uh, parallel conversations and then we'll be back here in the afternoon. So, Tom, over to you. Thanks. Can I call up my team, please? Hello, Velbo, come sit down. Jim, Urki, Jermaine. Great. Thank you. Well, hello once again. The topic of this morning's couch discussion is how to integrate persons with intellectual disabilities and learning difficulties into the workplace. Persons with intellectual difficulties and learning difficulties face some specific barriers in their search for decent workplaces. I hope this discussion will be able to highlight some existing pathways, hopefully, towards full inclusion in the workforce. I'll just introduce my co-couchers. I have on my right Valberger Fröhlich from A Tempo here in Austria, and then Germain Weber from Vienna University. Then on my left, Jim Crow from EASPD in Wales, and then Urki Pinoma from the Asper Foundation in Finland. Jim, will you tell us? I'm going to ask each person to explain a little bit about what they do, what their organization does in this realm, and then we'll go straight into the questions and really try and get as many as we can get done before 11 o'clock. So, Jim, over to you. Good morning. My name's Jim, Jim Crow. I'm president of the European Association of Service Providers for People with a Disability. We represent some 12,000 organizations in 33 European countries. We have a secretariat based in Brussels, and we work on three pillars of activity and action. The first is impact. We seek to influence the European institutions uh, within the European Union. We also seek to influence the Council of Europe and other important organizations like the International Labour Organization and other national and supranational bodies. Um, we have a conference coming up soon, the first world conference around supported employment called Employment for All. It will be taking place in Belfast and it's being organized jointly with the European Union of Supported Employment and their colleague uh, federations from the other continents across the globe. It's taking place in Belfast on June uh, 15th and 14th, I believe, 15th and 16th, I believe. So that's the advertising over. Um, my day job is I run uh, uh, Learning Disability Wales. I've been involved in the disability field for 30 years. Uh, and in Wales, we're about to start a, an excited, exciting supported employment project where we aim to get 600 young people with learning disability and or autism into real jobs for real pay over the next five years, working with partner organizations. Great, Jim, thanks very much. Velburger, can you tell us a, a wee bit about A Tempo's work? Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, well, before talking about uh, my organization and my work, let me tell you briefly some private background. So, I was born in a poor farmer's family in, a, in that time, very backward region. Would say children like me, with our starting position, are not to be sitting here in the UN city, 
being participant of a couch session in an international conference. But my parents and teachers, they trusted in me. And from time to time, I met people who challenged me to take the next great step. I tell you this story now, not to fishing for compliments. <laughs> the message which I want to give you is that everyone, every person needs to be encouraged to develop their own great goals in their life. And that is it, what I will try, what I'm trying to do with my organization. It is called A Tempo. We try to encourage people with learning difficulties. We don't say learning disabilities. We try to encourage them to learn, to work, to find their own way, to make their own decisions and to live their own life. We do that. In that way, we offer education. We offer education also for adults. We offer vocational training, tailored very individually. And we coach our trainees to find a place on the first labor market. We go with them till they found this place. And then, if they have found it, we support them in the company they are. And we support also the companies because we know a lot of companies do not have any knowledge how to change their culture into an inclusive culture. That is what we are doing. In detail, we give them advice how to create an environment, how to create processes and structures so that they are really able to, in to integrate people with learning difficulties. What I have learned in all these years is Never tell people that they won't be able to manage a challenge, but give them, provide them a challenge they will be able to manage. Great. Professor, can I call upon you next? Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is um, Germain, <coughs> Germain Weber. I am a professor in clinical psychology at the University of Vienna and also the vice dean of the faculty of psychology at the University of Vienna. And um, on the other hand, uh, I am also the president of the national association named Lebenshilfe Austria, which is the broadest uh, national organization serving for people with learning difficulties, with intellectual disabilities here in Austria. We serve for about 30,000 people over here and we have about 4,000 people supporting these, uh, these guys around in, in Austria. And um, uh, originally, coming to Valburga, I am originating from, an, uh, um, from a family from Luxembourg. So I am a Luxembourger. I am not originally born in, in Austria, but living since many years over here. And um, when I reflected uh, Valburga's um, reflections on how she came to that field, I think uh, I have also a, a modest um, family story about it. Um, I was raised in a large uh, multi-generational family in Luxembourg, and that time um, uh, lived with, uh, with us our grand-grandmother. And she developed dementia at that time. She was over 90 years old. And I was very impressed and, think, uh, and triggered by the, her behavioral changes and how the family coped with these changes and how they continued to support her with, without putting her in, an, in a geriatric institution. So my grandmother stayed and lived with us, included in the family, and that was in the, in the, ninth, in the 59th uh, to the early of the 60s it was. So it's many years ago for an inclusive attitude families had towards their family members. Maybe that triggered a little bit my research interest also when I was a student at the university, I was very much interested in, um, in what we name uh, human behavior is all managed through our brain. So I was very much on a cognitive neuroscience trip at that time. And, uh, and then later on, when I got my first job, I entered here in, in Vienna in a hospital for uh, 
Brain Damaged Children, and that was directed by Professor Andreas Rett, after whom is named the Rett Syndrome, that uh, many of you uh, are aware of over here. So I was very much in, in, uh, in touch then with persons and wanted to go on with my uh, neuro, uh, neuroscience research in, in this population, but then I got an, a very strong impression about the social backgrounds and the social conditions these persons and these families are living in, and that changed my research approach very much, coming more to a um, psychological, uh, social, um, social psychological research issues. And so we are at the university um, with our modest team and Linda Fischer and Andreas Kotzmann, they are over here uh, with me today. And uh, we, are tra we are working very much on various areas uh, in where people with intellectual disabilities encounter barriers in our society. Uh, if that is access to health systems, if that, that is access to, 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 to real jobs, if that is access to education, so we are really engaged with our research, with our psychological research in these areas contributing to um, the inclusion of people with uh, intellectual disabilities in our society. And, um, and then my function in Lebenshilfe offers me uh, the possibility to have access, but not only access in the Lebenshilfe Association, but in many other associations, also on the European level. We are with Lebenshilfe member of EFSPD, and uh, our um, research on job and job satisfaction has been discussed last year during this conference over here with Luc Zandalou, and we have got very much support from the network of e ESPD to continue with this work, and today we will speak a little bit about other research and job safety questions. So that is a little bit uh, the depiction of what we are doing here in Great. Vienna, Europe. Europe. Thank you so much. And Urki, over to you. Thank you. My name is Jyrki Pinoma, and I come from Finland. I believe I'm the only Finn in this room today, because the other one left the day before yesterday. <laughs> I come from ASPA Foundation, and I have to precise a little bit the foundations in Finland. It is not always about a huge amount of money in foundations. In our case, it is a huge amount of loan. But uh, uh, in Finland, we have many working foundations. We call them working foundations, and ASPA is one of those. ASPA was found, founded in 1995 by 13 Finnish uh, disability organizations. And uh, nowadays we run, we own 1,000 apartment in Finland and rent them to per persons with disabilities. And we also are a service provider, also a member of ESPD, and we provide services to 1,500 per persons with disabilities in, in Finland, all over the, all over the land. And, um, um, then I have to move to my other hats. We have learned that we have several hats, everybody here. And the most important of my hats is, of course, that I'm a father of two persons with disabilities. My sons, uh, Marcus, uh, 30 years old, and Robin, 25 years old, uh, are both uh, uh, persons with uh, intellectual disabilities and also physical disabilities. And they nowadays live by their own, in their own home, uh, and have, have a service 24-7. Uh, I have been working on uh, disability, uh, of course, all these 30 years after Marcus' birth. And uh, I have been uh, president of Inclusion Finland for five years. Actually, I'm running for the next presidency also next year. But the bigger hat, once more, is the Presidency of Inclusion Europe, which I will start next year, the four-year period. So uh, that's about me, maybe. So we can discuss about employment also. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. The first question we have is for Velburga, and that is, what are the barriers to employment for persons with learning disabilities, and how do you think they should be best overcome? I know it's a huge question, but at least we can make a dent in it. Very huge question, yes. So, there are a lot of barriers. Um, I would like to point out on three. So, what I see is a huge lack of education for people with learning difficulties. 
So in Austria, people with learning difficulties has to leave school in the age of 15, usually, at least 18 years. So I think that's so stupid, because we all know that especially people with learning difficulties need much more time to learn than others. And I think I know, and you know, a lot of people with learning difficulties who are really able to learn much more than we ever have thought. And that brings me to the next barrier. It's also a lack, but I think it's a lack of competences from us. Because a lot of trainers, teachers, and supporters, pedagogical staff, they don't really know how people learn. They don't really have knowledge about how to create individual learning materials. They don't really have knowledge about all the inspiring technologies which are available at the moment and which are accessible for people with learning difficulties. And that's the reason why people with learning difficulties don't know these technologies. And it is because all these teachers and so on don't like technology. Yeah? They are the bottleneck. And um, what I think is um, when we, we ourselves don't go for a mindset change, we can't ask it from the companies. So it's, it's first our turn, and then we can tell other people how to change their mind. So I think all my colleagues here will know lots of uh, barriers. I want like I would like to point out one in particular, which I guess is not so easy to understand, um, but I have experienced it in my company. It's the idea of everyone, everybody has to work with the same speed. So we have this idea in our society that everyone have, has to work in the same pace. And um, we know that isn't, that isn't possible. It isn't possible for people with learning difficulties have the same, have to have the same pace like, like you and me. And in my company, uh, we have uh, ab about 80 employees and 15 of them are people, are employees with disabilities. So 15 to 80, it's a percentage rate, which is a normal rate for occurring disability in our society, 15 till 20 percent. That's the reason why I say our company is a normal company. But what we, we had, the biggest challenge was to create an environment which makes it possible that people with different paces can work and cooperate together. But then when we have challenged, when we have managed this challenge, the whole company, entire, the entire company really benefits from this type of diversity. So I can, I can tell you, try it. It's really fine. Thank you so much. Urki, have you got something to add? I, I could just comment on that, that um, one, one of the biggest barriers, or at least in my country, has been that people with intellectual disabilities has always been treated as a group yeah. of persons. I think the most important is to see the individuals, because we all are individuals, we all have very individual ways to live and ways to express ourselves. Yeah. And if we see persons as individuals, maybe we see their abilities too. And of course, one of the, the barriers is always also the, the word disability. We should forget it as we have already agreed on the first day here. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Um, Jim or Jamal, have either of you got anything to add? Um, with respect to barriers. Yes. Yes, with respect to barriers. I think what uh, Valborga was telling us is uh, very right and uh, that we have lots of barriers and, and these barriers are really beginning with the educational vocational system. That is um, very, uh, a very crucial point of this. Or, or, or wording it in the sense our 
uh, last night, our last uh, keynote speaker was saying, uh, why should we allow people with intellectual disabilities to enter vocational training systems? Why should we allow them? Huh? That was a very uh, um, um, stunning uh, question he was yeah. posing. And um, I think in Austria, now coming to Austria, we still have the situation that people with intellectual disabilities would in many areas of Austria go to um, so-called special school systems. A special school system is preparing these students for, um, um, for these workshops we have set up, and with, which are sheltered workshops. And in Austria, people with intellectual disabilities are seen by law as not being, having the capacity to work. So they have no right to be seen legally as a person who can work, and so they are seen as a person whom we support with uh, somebody, something called like uh, occupational therapy. So it is still the medical model in there. And they are going and attending workshops we are setting up as Lebenshilfe to offer them something we think is more a real job situation. Huh? And they experience this. And they are there and they are offered occupational therapy, but they are doing productive work, industrial work in there and they will get no wage, no payment. They will get something which we name in our legal system in Austria, pocket money. And the, mean, uh, the median uh, allowance of this is about 55 euros a month for them here in Austria, one of the richest countries in the European Union. And, and, and then we have a couple of barriers coming out of this. That is, uh, the, the national attitude and the legal attitude where we are coming from. And we want to change the system, coming, uh, coming up to supported employment, which, which we will have in experience in many uh, countries in the, in the work. And um, the projects what Porga is telling about is a, a model project in Austria where people with intellectual disabilities, with learning difficulties, will get a wage and are on a first market situation, but that is an, a very little number of people compared to all these 40,000 which we have in Austria in, in sheltered workshops over here. And barriers are um, insufficient training opportunities for these people, vocational training opportunities, and when we speak to people from a first market, large uh, companies in Austria, then they, and, and those companies who who, have, um, who would have a culture to include people with intellectual disabilities in, in, their, in, in their organizations, uh, would answer there is a lack of available job candidates, so, because we have them in the other system. So, so that would be one of these points. Great, thanks. If I, Jim, yeah, yes, absolutely. I, I'll try and be brief. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, just, we are all believers in this room. We all understand we all want to see the United Nations Convention become a reality. And there are many structural issues in our, in our various countries, but often it's not about resources. It's about, are people with disabilities visible in our societies, in our communities? And then, as has been said in a number of our workshops over the last couple of days, and we were talking earlier about it, Yuki and I, it's attitude. It's expectations, it's assumptions. We have to challenge negative attitudes towards people with disabilities. We need to have much greater expectations of people with, learning, with disabilities, not, not just learning disabilities. And we also need to allow disabled people to fulfill their dreams and their ambitions just as we have had opportunities, whether we're disabled or not in this room, to have had our ambitions fulfilled. Great, thank you very much indeed. I think we've just got time for one more, but I think it's really important, this whole issue of individuality. We're all individuals. And I think um, some of the work that Germain has been doing, and um, I think it really goes to the core is, it appears to me that the topic of intellectual disabilities and job satisfaction is a topic that has been neglected. And um, 
people get put into places or told to do jobs which they might be totally unsatisfied with, and it's totally unsuitable. What has been the results of your research on that? Oh, um, re results are forthcoming. So we, we started this re research uh, one and a half year ago, and we made literature research on this. And what we can find is that job satisfaction from a um, vocational psychology um, standards uh, in the field of intellectual disability research is very scarce. Yeah. That's the first point. Very, very scarce. And then researchers used probably questionnaires which are not really linked to uh, vocational psychological theories, not well based on the theoretical models. So what we tried at this moment in the last months is uh, setting up a new questionnaire uh, for measuring job satisfaction on a high level, on a high scientific level, with, um, with um, a questionnaire that is, has uh, good standards in validity, good standards in reliability, and we are on the point to finish this, and that is also um, uh, written in easy to understand language so that we can go on with interviews with the individual with interviews and um, so that is very important and the, the other thing is as I told you as we are still on a transition from a medical model to a real job model in the medical model, nobody would ask for job satisfaction in that model it, they would ask for rehabilitation uh, indicators uh, how yeah. the people would uh, would, would uh, go on with their rehabilitation program. So this is something very, very new, and this is also something we think it is very important to use um, um, nowadays um, very uh, current theoretical models to measure this and compare the job satisfaction ex experience in different um, environments of people with intellectual disabilities in traditional workshops and in first market workshops where they get a, a wage and what, what the effect is on job satisfaction. So job satisfaction would be something um, that is an attitude toward one's job based on an evaluation of different judgments, um, especially on the job itself, on the effective experiences about the job and uh, about uh, the beliefs uh, the persons have about their, their jobs. And, uh, and one of the themes would also be their, their payment and their wage in, in, in this situation. So wage, we know, is not the main and the single factor to generate job satisfaction. There are other areas which are very, very much important. And we want to, to highlight with our research areas that contribute to job satisfaction in, uh, in, in, uh, in the fields of people with intellectual disabilities. And as we know, and coming to our very first session of this morning, well-being, job sat satisfaction refers to general well-being yeah. of a person and to mental health of a person. So will we invest in vocational training or will, will we invest more in our mental health support for this person after they have no job satisfaction and very poor job satisfaction in their vocational life? That is the question we have to pose. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you very much. Jim, have you got anything to um, add? Um, uh, no, I, I, okay. I, I really, I, I, I think uh, Germain has said it all really, in terms of job satisfaction. How can somebody be expected to undertake a job if they do not get some fulfillment, something out of it that, that, that is a two-way thing? We all want that in our, in our working lives. Why should it be any different for a person with a disability? Yeah, I totally agree. Okay. I could say that uh, if you find a job which interests you genuinely, then you can also find job satisfaction, of course. I can tell about a Finnish rap artist. Yeah. He was uh, looking for a pl place to work after school, and the social workers just offered him something he didn't want to have. He wanted to be a reporter, radio reporter. And there happened to be a radio station for persons with disabilities in Finland, and he got the job there. Of course, he's a rap artist. He wants to perform all the time. So he's reporting now. Very good. great. Little difference between the two. <laughs> Very good. Wonderful. And Valboga, have you anything to add? Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I, I thought about what, what might be a good job for, mm. for disabled persons. So yeah. Because um, 
so where is this? Where are these jobs? Which kind of jobs? Yeah, and um, my experience is that many people think um, working at the copy machine might be a good job for people with learning difficulties or um, buying the sandwiches for the colleagues, for the break of the colleagues. And maybe, as, of course, there are some people with learning difficulties who could manage these jobs. But um, I think um, it's, it's really hard to understand the thousand different functions and dysfunctions of a modern copy machine. So even the sellers uh, understand them. I know it because we had to translate a technical function sheet from a big company for copy machines into easy to read version. So, and, and it's the same with buying sandwiches for the colleagues because the one likes the sandwich with ham and cheese and the other one is used to eat only vegetarian and the next one would like it to have with tomatoes and if tomatoes are not available with cucumbers but never ever with pepperoni and so on. So, no way, that isn't a good job for people with learning difficulties. So, what is a good job? I think a good job is a job which requires exactly that performance which fits to the competences of the person. And in my experience, we see that these jobs we often have to create. They are not announced in the newspapers. So we have to go to the companies and we have to create with them in cooperation these new jobs. For example, it might be that the person likes to do a task every time in the same way. We have such employees in our company. It could be a good job for this person to be the controller of all security and safety and health facilities because he wouldn't accept any deviation from the norm. All you, all, all you need is to provide good tools so that the person knows how to, how to control and that the person will not forget anything. And I have this employee, this employee, and that's the reason why I'm so happy as the manager of my organization, because I know my employee will control all these things about fire protection, health and safety, and I can sleep well. So I think a good job is a job which makes everybody happy. The employee, and the employer. Wonderful, thank you very much. I'm very sorry that um, we've come to the end of our time. Um, I think probably if I'm going to sum up something which has come out from our very, very brief discussion, and I don't know how many of you know that I live in New York, and in New York, the real estate um, business there has one kind of expression, which is location, location, location. And I think what comes out of our discussion, it's Individual, individual, individual. If you want to talk with my fellow co-couchers, they're around, they are the experts. And um, I'd like to thank you all very much indeed for joining me, and I'm only sad we didn't have time to chat more. Many thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. <laughs>